Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to In User Education. Um, today's lecture is about energy of nucleus. And um, well, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on unizor.com. I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website unizor.com. You have to go through Physics for Teens to energy, and then there is a nuclear energy uh, chapter in this. Um, because every lecture on the web on this website has a textual um, detailed notes uh, which basically can be used as a, a textbook and then well it's it's the course I mean on the website it's the course it has certain chapters it has logical connection between different parts different lectures it's not like you just found one particular lecture on YouTube or somewhere else and it's just by itself. It's not. This is the course and I do recommend you uh, to take the whole course. Plus, on the same website you have a prerequisite course called Math for Teens. You know, Math is uh, the mandatory part of the any physics course, so I do suggest you to be um, relatively proficient in Math, uh, in particular Calculus, Vector Algebra, that's all important. All right, so today we'll talk about nuclear energy, but I would like to start from a couple of previous lectures where we were also talking about um, energy. They're all related um, between uh, themselves. We started with mechanical energy, which is energy of the macro objects moving or positioned against each other. That was our first kind of introduction to energy topic. Our next one was related to looking into the micro objects to see what are the smallest um, parts of any object which is still maintaining its characteristics and this is a molecule. Like a molecule of water is still a water but anything less than the molecule is already not a water. So whenever we are talking about the molecule molecules inside the macro objects molecules are moving and the moving of these molecules is a next type of energy which we were talking about the thermal energy or heat okay so let's go even deeper than that what happens if we will go inside the molecules well molecules are um, can contain atoms inside so basically any kind of a combination of atoms make a molecule now um, there are only like about a hundred different atom types but the number of molecules is tremendous like thousands or millions um, that's different types of uh, substances which we are dealing with and now from all these atoms um, we can create the molecules so something like a hundred different types of mo uh, atoms combined together in different quantities make all the um, millions of molecules now so what happens with the uh, next level as we are going inside the molecule to the atomic level well there is a chemical energy that's the next type of energy we w which we were talking about so as we go deeper inside the, um, the objects, to the molecules, to the atoms, we are uncovering different types of energy. So chemical energy is the energy which is related to atomic bonds. So whenever we are breaking some uh, molecules into individual atoms and combining into other molecules, this is the process which is called chemical reaction and rearranging the atoms either consumes or releases energy. Now, let's go inside the atoms. <laughs> this is our last, um, last movement towards uh, the depths of the uh, matter, how the matter actually is organized. Um, so, what's inside the atoms? Well, the very simplified and uh, I would say very classical model of atom is that atom contains three kinds of particles two heavy ones proton and neutron 
combined together in different quantities make up nucleus of the atom and electrons are orbiting around this nucleus. Um, now protons and electrons are electrically charged particles, positive and negative correspondingly. Neutrons are electrically negative. So this is the model of atom. So in this simplified model, again model, it's not what's happening in reality. I don't know what's happening in reality, but this is a good model. It allows us to do a lot of different things, which basically correspond to our experimental data. So, from only these three types of particles, at least as it was known in the beginning of 20th century, uh, we combine them together into uh, about a hundred different atoms. So, what 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 actually is happening? Well, different number of protons and neutrons make certain nucleus, and then number of electrons in electrically neutral element should be equal to the number of protons, plus and minus, right? So they are neutral. So the only difference between all these 100 uh, uh, of different types of atoms is the number of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. And obviously number of electrons probably should be equal to number of protons for electrically neutral elements. Now, very similarly to chemical energy related to chemical reaction, which is actually rearranging of atoms into different molecules. Same thing with nuclear energy is related to nuclear reaction whenever we are rearranging protons and neutrons which are making some atoms into different atoms. So again, we can break, for instance, uh, the molecule into individual atoms, regroup them to get another molecule. That's the chemical reaction and the energy is either released or consumed. Same thing here. We are breaking atoms into individual protons and neutrons, reconfigure, regroup them together into different atoms, and as a result we will get either consumed or released certain amount of energy. So this is a general hierarchical view of different types of um, energy as we are going deeper and deeper inside the, the, uh, the matter. So we have mechanical, we have uh, thermal, we have chemical and nuclear energy. All right, so that's a good introduction. Now, next question is, well, we know um, and if you don't, don't just, just believe me that uh, there is an electrical um, component in the construction of the atoms. I was talking about positively charged protons and negatively charged neutrons, uh, uh, sorry, uh, electrons. Neutrons are n uh, neutrally charged. Electri there is no um, charge uh, I inside the neutron. Now, the opposite um, Electrically, po electrically positive and electrically negative particles, electrically, part uh, electrically charged, they are um, attracting each other. Similarly charged, like proton and proton, or electron and electron, repel each other. Well, this is the nature of electricity. We will talk about this um, whenever we will consider the electricity. But in this particular case, this is just something which is, well, you can say the law of nature or whatever it is. Now, knowing this, the question arises, what keeps protons and neutrons together in the nucleus if, let's forget about neutrons for a while, but protons are repelling each other. So why doesn't a uh, nucleus just fall apart into different uh, protons and, uh, and, and neutrons. Why is it together, like 50 different neutrons and 48 different protons, together they are forming a nucleus of some element. I don't remember which one, doesn't matter. Okay, so there is very important consideration and 
Well, basically physicists were thinking about this. They knew electricity, they knew that the protons are positively charged and they must repel each other. So something holds them together. What? Well, the answer is there is yet another force in the nature. Not only gravitational force, not only electromagnetic, electromagnetic uh, force, there is also some other force which is called strong force. Now, why is it called strong force? Well, the answer is actually obvious because it's, it should be stronger than electricity because the protons together if they want to stay inside the nucleus they might some th there, there must be something which keeps them together that's what keeps them together the strong force so the strong force is stronger than um, uh, 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 electrical uh, repelling force and that's why um, the uh, the nucleus actually doesn't fall apart into individual um, particles the only thing which is kind of different di uh, well it's important let's put it this way strong force acts if this is the proton and this is the proton it acts between them this is a positive and this is a positive it actually acts on a very very short distance if two protons on a bigger distance, the strong force, so it's not really strong enough, okay? So the strength of the uh, strong force is increasing as we are moving uh, closer and closer, and obviously decreasing if we are moving them apart. Now, the um, the law of changing the strengths of the strong force is such that on a longer distance it's, practi it's practically undetectable but in a short distance a very short distance very much comparable to the nucleus size the strong force is significantly stronger like a hundred times stronger than the electricity uh, the electrical force of repelling from each other so, to keep the, pr uh, the protons together, well, and neutrons as well, because there is a strong force between all of them, to keep the nucleus together, we have to really move all these particles very close together, and then the strong force will really catch them up. Because if they are, an, uh, if they are really apart, then the strong force is not really um, uh, strong enough, and the electrical um, repelling would probably be stronger to force the uh, particles to go into different directions. Alright, so we have introduced a new concept, a strong force which keeps the nucleus together. Which means that if we want to reorganize the atom we have to somehow break some strong forces and rearrange them into a different configuration so other strong forces will take hold. So, this is the source of nuclear energy. So, in some cases, if we are doing certain nuclear reaction, the overall energy is released, in some cases it's consumed. It's exactly the same as in the course of chemical reaction we are either releasing or consuming certain amount of energy depending on what exactly we are doing. So let's just think about what exactly can happen in what cases. Let's consider that we have an atom of um, hydrogen. It has um, a proton and it has an electron on an orbit. So this is positive one, this is negative one, and that's why the whole thing is basically um, electrically neutral. Now, there are different 
um, isotopes, if, 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 if I can say, of um, hydrogen. This is the regular hydrogen. Um, there is a deuterium which has um, neutron as well. Now, what happens if we will combine proton and neutron to make a, an atom of um, deuterium? Well, think about it this way. There is a strong force between them, right? Let me just give you an example. Let's say we have an object above the Earth. And then we dropped it down. What happens? Well, at this position, it has certain potential energy, right? Whenever we drop it down, it hits the ground. It has no more potential energy. So where is the energy going? Well, the energy uh, will be uh, converted into probably some kind of a, a thermal energy because we are squeezing the molecules of the ground, so probably they are heating a little bit or something like this. So, the kinetic energy uh, of these uh, pieces of the ground which we are heating with our object, whatever conversion is, but it happens and the potential energy here is converted into other kinds of energy which is released. It's like thermal energy or kinetic energy, whatever it is. It's released. And our object is on the surface of the Earth anymore. It does not have any potential energy. Now, what happens if our proton and neutron are at certain distance from each other? Well, in this case, there is no electricity among them, right? Because the proton is positively, but ne neutron is neutral, so there is no electrical force. Uh, in between. So the only force is the strong force. Yes, granted, it actually acts in a very small distance, but what does it mean? It's still, I mean, whenever the distance is greater, it still acts, but it's weaker. Same thing like the gravity. Gravity on the surface of the Earth is stronger than if we will go up, let's say, a uh, thousand kilometers up um, uh, from the Earth and the gravity will be smaller, right? Remember, the gravity is actually decreasing with the distance, um, inversely proportional to a square of a distance between the centers. Here is the same thing, it's just not the square proportional uh, or inverse proportional, but there is definitely some kind of potential energy because there is an attraction between them, this strong force is, a, is the force of attraction. So there is a potential energy. Now, so what happens if we are uh, making them closer together, if they fall on each other? Well, there is no more potential energy, right? So, where is the energy? Well, whenever we are moving proton and neutron, or rather the atom of hydrogen, and add the the uh, the neutron into this so that uh, the neutron and proton will uh, combine together because of the strong force potential energy which they which they had before they are together when they are apart must be converted into some other form of energy and released obviously the same thing as if I will drop something on the floor the potential energy is converted into kinetic, thermal, whatever it is. So here is exa exactly the same thing. So some form of energy, um, uh, thermal energy, electromagnetic, I don't know, whatever it is, it should be released in some way or another. Which means that by doing this, we can actually release certain energy. So this is a nuclear reaction combining proton and neutron together to form the atom of de de deuterium uh, uh, produces certain amount of energy. That's very, very important. There is one more very interesting um, thing and it's related to theory of relativity which I know we didn't go yet but everybody knows a beautiful formula which is actually the most famous formula in physics. The energy is equal mass times 
uh, square of the uh, speed of light. So, energy and mass are always related. If we have certain particles and then we have a nucleus which contains these particles but certain amount of energy has been released what does it mean? Well, it means that we have lost certain amount of mass as well and the mass of proton plus mass of neutron should be greater than the mass of proton plus neutron. This is called the fact of mass and it is indeed true. The sum of two masses is greater than the mass of the uh, nucleus of deuterium in this particular case. So, and that's because energy is always related to mass. Since we have released certain amount of energy, used to be potential energy, now we don't have it, so it's released in some form or another, which means we have lost certain amount of mass. So, um, okay, now, now let's think about bigger bigger atoms. This is uh, an atom of hydrogen, and there are only like two uh, particles inside the nucleus, proton and neutron. What if you have bigger uh, atoms? Well, bigger atoms have more protons, and if you would like to combine two different atoms, like, know, for instance, um, uh, atom which contains, I know, 15 protons plus 14 neutrons, and combine it with 12 protons and 10 neutrons. If we will combine these two nucleuses together, what happens with energy? Well, that's not such a simple answer, because don't forget that since there are protons here and here, they are repelling each other. So it's not so much, you know, it's not as easy as, as in this particular case to combine them. It's not as clear now, because the energy, um, we have to really um, combine whatever the potential energy these two have uh, when they are apart should actually be somehow compared with repelling energy, which is also a potential energy. If two things are together, we are holding them together using something, but they still have a potential energy because if we will break the link, break the strong force, then they will just fly apart. That's a potential energy, like a spring, right? The, spring, it, 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 the compressed spring has a potential energy. So in this particular case, if we will combine them into one nucleus, they would have potential energy inside as an, as an electrostatic repu repulsion, right? So it looks like if we have bigger atoms, it's not really obvious whether the potential energy of the strong force when they are apart is bigger or smaller than potential energy of the electrostatic repellent when they are together. So what's the final um, equation, what's the final result, whether energy will be released or consumed, depends on comparison between the potential energy of the strong force when they are apart and potential energy of the electrostatic repellent repelling when they are together. So the calculations show that as we are combining bigger and bigger atoms, in the beginning, when we have very, very, very few number of protons, the final result will be releasing the energy. But at some moment, as we are making greater, uh, we are dealing with greater and greater atoms, um, it becomes the other way around. Somewhere on the level of iron, the atom of iron, uh, we have this borderline when it's almost the same thing. So lighter than iron atoms probably will release certain amount of energy and heavier will consume. 
what it also means that the opposite process if we will break the nucleus into parts if we will break the small one we will have to actually um, uh, consume certain amount but if we will break the, bre the, the bigger ones where the electrostatic energy is a uh, significant potential energy of repelling and we will break the strong forces so we will let this spring um, which basically imitates the um, electrostatic repelling if we will let that spring to go that would release so the heavy atoms produce energy if we split them the light elements produce certain amount of energy if we um, make them from from their own parts particles rather and these are two very 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 important processes in nuclear reaction this process is fusion when we are fusing together and the process whenever we are breaking the big atom into its pieces it's called fission and both are the processes where, where we can use this uh, energy produced uh, produced by these reactions so whenever we are fusing certain light atoms we are producing energy and it's used in hydrogen bomb unfortunately now whenever we are splitting the heavy atoms like plutonium for instance we are producing energy which is the fission reaction so this is where the atomic bomb the first bombs actually were invented and later on we have learned actually how to control this nuclear reaction of fission and we use them in nuclear power plants um, is uh, using the fusion to produce electricity in some kind of a power plants is kind of questionable right now I mean there are experimental um, uh, processes but it's still experimental now the fission is very much used all over the world nuclear power stations um, are used everywhere unfortunately we had certain disasters we had Chernobyl disaster and we have in Japan Fukushima um, disaster so uh, probably the work should be done to make to make it much safer than they are right now but anyway the number of nuclear power stations is really very very large and we can use relatively safely relatively safely um, this nuclear energy there are some other obviously issues with the result of this uh, splitting it's not so easy I mean we will talk about the details what exactly is fusion and what exactly is fission what exactly components um, which are produced when we are making one reaction or another reaction but as of right now this is an introductory lecture to nuclear um, power nuclear reaction the energy of the nucleus that's probably a sufficient information so light atoms can produce um, energy if we fuse elementary particles or parts of these atoms and the fission is used when we are splitting the heavy atoms like plutonium or uranium or whatever okay so that's it for today that's kind of a introduction into what nuclear energy is and where it stands in the hierarchy of different energies i do suggest you to read the textual part there are some um, interesting numbers about the strengths of the strong forces relatively to electrostatic ones it's all on the website on unizor.com um, in the physics 14 course so thanks very much and good luck <laughs>